Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today has been on the show before. Her name is Dr. Michelle Tolefson, but today she's going to be talking about insights from the Blue Zone, strategies for a healthier, happier life. And it's perfect because today, September 1st, is my 45th vegan anniversary, meaning I have been vegan for 45 years. And what's really cool about the Blue Zones is maybe they're not 100% vegan, except for perhaps the people in Loma Linda, many of them are, they are primarily vegan. And maybe that's one of the secrets to longevity that we're going to learn from Dr. Tollefson. Please welcome her back to the show. I love that blue you wear. That is a stunning color in general, but on you in particular. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to come back and speak to you and to your listeners. And then also congratulations on your 45th anniversary. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, I know they call me the vegan OG. I'm in the vegan hall of fame and you know, I've been vegan longer than some of these, you know, esteemed doctors that I get to work with. And that's a, 45 years is, a, is longer than a lot of people have been alive. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's so exciting. And I 100% agree with you that I think a large portion of the key to why people have lived so long in the blue zones is because of their food is because they're whole, um, because they eat a lot of whole foods and they eat a lot of plants. So, um, I think you're definitely, definitely right. Well, how did, you know, how did you get into studying or being so interested in the blue zones? Was it, did, did you visit any of them? Yeah. So sure. I, I have researched lifestyle medicine, been a leader in the field of lifestyle medicine for years and seeing the research that had come out around the blue zones and Dan Butner's work. I read some of his books, which I highly recommend read his books and started to see so many of the similarities between what they were seeing in the research for the blue zones, which are the five areas around the world where the communities have lived the longest, the healthiest. And Dan Butner, his team from National Geographic and some other researchers have done a lot of work with those communities to find out to find out what's going on, what are some of the common threads, even though they're such different cultures and they have different a lot of different habits, what are the commonalities? And when you start to read the Blue Zones work, what you notice is that many of the commonalities are aligned with the uh, lifestyle medicine pillars, the eating whole food plant predominant with getting enough exercise, managing stress, prioritizing sleep, maintaining social connections and avoiding risky substances. And so you see that over and over. And so it just is this beautiful alignment. When I finished my treatment for, um, for breast cancer, I knew that I wanted to do everything. And while I was going through it, everything that I could to lead the healthiest life. And I, I had already embraced many healthy lifestyle behaviors, but I really wanted to go visit the blue zone. So it was kind of a, a celebration. So I went with my family a couple of years ago for a couple of weeks and fell in love with it. I actually went to the blue zone on the Nicoyan peninsula and was able to really immerse myself in that environment. And I really, even though I had read the research, it's another thing to be there and actually experience it. And so it was good for me to take some lessons, even though I already lived a healthy lifestyle to take some of those things I learned from the blue zone and to bring them back into my life. And that's what I hope to share with you and your listeners today are some tips and tricks that they can use. Um, and then I returned to Costa Rica just because I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the culture. I fell in love with the um, the animals and the, the uh, biodiversity and the plants uh, and their food. I fell in love with all of that. And so my family and I returned for another couple of weeks this summer. And that's where I decided to also put together a trip to bring others with me to help educate and educate them and then help them to experience the blue zone, which I'll mention at the end. Wow. The, the only blue zone I visited was Loma Linda, but I hear so many wonderful things about Costa Rica and so many guests on this show live there. They're, they're plant-based chefs or uh, property or hotel owners. And they just, they, everyone seems to have nothing but wonderful things to say about it and the produce and just the lifestyle there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I have a presentation I would love to share with you and your listeners, if that's all right. We love, I, well, I don't know about the listeners. I <laughs> love presentations. Listeners probably need to listen, but the viewers can be so oh, beautiful. <laughs> Great. So yes, I want to share some tips that you can take from the Blue Zones. So first of all, I'm not an official Blue Zones representative. That's a whole company, which I'd encourage you to check out Dan Butner's his books on the Blue Zones. He has several different Blue Zones books and, um, and he also has a website and I'd encourage you to check it out. But the Blue Zones are those places on earth where people are living longer, healthier. 
So this isn't looking at the population that we'll be talking a little bit more about in Costa Rica, but it's looking at overall life expectancy. And you can see in the United States, ours has been steady for several years, um, maybe even dropping in the last couple of years with, with the pandemic. And Costa Rica's um, has continued to rise. And so if we look at that population, the blue zone, we actually see even more of a difference. They only spend about one fifteenth as much as we do on healthcare. So they aren't spending as much, but they are living longer, healthier lives. If we look at all U.S. causes of death, you can see on age, as we move along the x-axis, we see age. And so you can see once you get to about, oh, well, just as you as you get older, the risk of dying from non-communicable diseases increases. And non-communicable di non diseases are non-infectious diseases. Those are those heart disease are dying from complications of type 2 diabetes or a stroke. And so blue and purple are those non-communicable diseases, whereas red are infectious diseases. You can see you still may die from that, but the risk is pretty small. And then also green, those are like um, transport injuries, unintentional injuries, or self-harm or violence. But you can see most people are dying in the United States from non-communicable disease. And it's not even just early death. When we think about, when we think about the blue zones, when we think about people living longer, healthier. So it's not that they have huge nursing homes and everybody's in a nursing home and they're just living, they're living for a long life, but they're they're not taking, they're not able to take care of themselves, or they're not independent. Rather, they're that there are populations of people that are thriving very late into life, into their 90s or even centenarians into their hundreds. If you look at this, this is years lost due to disability from non-communicable disease. So this means how many years people are losing because they're disabled or healthy years that they're losing because of, of diseases that are related to lifestyle. And so you see this huge difference between the United States. I mean, you see us bright red and there's some other countries in, in Europe that are, are you know orange or, or deep red but it's not the rest of the world. You can see we are missing out in the United States on healthy years of life because of our lifestyle habits. And so I think it's easy to look at this and say, oh, well, yep, the United States is, is pretty bad. But when you think about think about the, the relatives that you've lost or the, or the people who have lost good years of their life because of these lifestyle-related diseases. And that's why I get so excited about trying to help people make lifestyle changes so that they can live longer and healthier lives, not just living longer, but healthier, healthier lives. So you could say, well, why is it that, that in the United States that we have such a year, high years loss of disability from non-communicable disease? Is it because of our genetics? I would say probably not. Is it because we have, um, you know, is there something in our water? I would say, I don't think that that's just it. When you look at this and you see such a stark difference, you start to think what's going on in that environment that's making those people have so many years lost due to disability. And so these are the five blue zones identified by Dan Butner and his research colleagues. Um, as Chef AJ mentioned, we have Loma Linda in the United States and California, Nicoya, Costa Rica, the Nicoyan Peninsula, I'll be discussing more. The other three blue zones in the world are Sardinia, Italy, Caria, Greece, and Okinawa, Japan. And this is where they have those pockets of people that are living longer, healthier lives that they're researching. So the area I'll talk about today is the blue zone of Costa Rica, and I circled it in blue on the map, and that is that is the area where these populations or where this population of people who are living longer, healthier lives tends to be in Costa Rica. On the right is a picture of my family when we were just visiting a few weeks ago with one of the um, Chotegra Indians. The people who seem to be living the longest and healthiest are, are descended from, um, or many are descended from the Chotegra Indians, where they have, where they're eating a lot of whole foods, a lot of, a lot of fruits and a lot of vegetables, um, not ultra processed food, right? They have many of those, those deep traditions. And so we got to, to meet and to work with some of the um, Chotegra Indians when we were in Costa Rica. Also, this is their environment. I took some pictures. I took a picture of my breakfast one morning of the fresh fruit. Oh my goodness, uh, the papayas and the mangoes and and um, the fresh fruit and their rice and their beans and their picadillo. Their food is amazing. And um, and then also their land. They're walking. They're you're not you're not experiencing all of this uh, junk food or you, you're not in the blue zone. There's more. Um, you order and then they prepare your meal. It's not that you just have this ultra processed food everywhere or in the traffic jam. So it's a very different environment than we have in many places in the United States. And it's really that environmental part that plays such a key role. 
So if I look at what's happening in the blue zones and what we seem to see are those threads, um, looking at the blue zones research, we see that they align with the lifestyle medicine pillars. And these are the lifestyle medicine pillars, the healthful eating of a whole plant-based food um, or plant predominant, increased physical activity, develop strategies to manage stress, to form and maintain rel relationships, to improve your sleep and to avoid risky substances. And you see that this really falls into play in our blue zones. So Dan Butner's blue zones, I think they're called the power nine. The one that I, I don't put on here when I'm listing these, um, he also includes wine at five. And I believe that that's um, most likely an association, but not a cause of the long life. Um, but I just out of, out of um, respect for his work, he does list that in the power nine um, that many people have maybe a small, a small amount of an alcoholic beverage with friends and with a meal um, in moderation. But I recommend, I I recommend um, my my guidance would be to to avoid that. But his other the other eight of the blue zones top eight I do fully support. So plant slant or plant all the way plant predominant eating eighty percent rule. So stopping eating when your stomach is about eighty percent full in the United States. If you look at our portion sizes, they have grown and grown and grown and grown and grown over the years. If you just look at decade after decade, and so in the blue zones, there's um, eating, enjoying food, eating it with friends, but then stopping when you're about eighty percent full and not overindulging or eating an excessive amount to move naturally. Their environments tend to lend themselves to natural movement. So they're not all going to the gym every day, but rather they're walking from house to house or walking to work or riding their bike here or there. They're gardening lots of beautiful gardens and they're gardening. They're reaching over and, and bending and picking different things. Um, downshift. So have time to relax and to decrease stress. We see that throughout the blue zones. When we look at all five of the blue zones, we see that as a common theme to belong. Many of people are part of a faith community. All those, those faith communities differ significantly. Many people in blue zones are part of a faith community. And maybe that's part of the reason too. Loved ones first, they usually are surrounded by family. So rarely do you see somebody um, like a centenarian who's separated from their family, but rather they're probably living next to or in the same house as other relatives. You often see multiple generations living together or living really nearby where the grandparent may help take care of the grandkids, the, the Grandkids may be helping care for the, the um, centenarian as they age. The right tribes are usually surrounded by friends as well. So we see that social connection come in through faith, family, and friends. And then purpose. We know that if you um, find somebody who has a strong sense of purpose, that it's associated with increased years of healthy life lived. And we see a strong sense of purpose when we look at these five blue zones. So we see those similarities. First, I'd love to, like to discuss some of the what we find out as far as nutrition when we look at the blue zones. Once again, these are my own kind of takes on the blue zones, looking at Dan Butner's research, looking at my own experience in Costa Rica, taking my experience as a lifestyle medicine expert and a physician, and then um, giving these thoughts to you. But fruit and vegetable consumption, we know in the United States that we do not eat enough fruits and vegetables. In fact, you can see on this map, these are the percentage of people consuming two or more fruits and three or more vegetables daily. And if you look at this, if you're doing really good on the map, it's not even 10%. So like what's supposed to be like, yeah, you know, good, good for Texas, but really our, our numbers are really low. We are fiber, fiber starved in the United States. We are not getting our fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but we see these individual food choices actually have a significant impact on life expectancy. And sometimes I work, I work with a lot of older women. Sometimes I'll say, well, I'm, I, I'm 80 and um, you know, I've, I have a, all these years of, of not eating healthy, I don't know if it's even worth it. It is worth it. Those changes, it is never too late to start eating healthier. If you want, you can go to this food for healthy life calculator and it's really cool. You can put in different dietary changes. So increasing the legumes that you eat is the red line across the top. If you make the change at 20, you um, on average gain about an extra two and a half years of living. As you as it, you get older, it's not as much of an increase, but still a significant increase. And they looked at this for whole grains. If I start eating whole grains, if I start eating more nuts, if I or if I start eating nuts, if I decrease my red meat, if I decrease processed meat, of course, cutting it out altogether is better. But they look at these different things in the research and what it shows you is that if you keep, if you make these changes, this all adds up your life expectancy, um, your expected life expectancy continues to, to go up. So the food guidelines that Dan Butner gives um, in his blue zone work are retreat from meat. This gives me a picture of like somebody running away. Like there's like a hamburger or something. And I'm trying to escape it. Like, ah, 
retreat from meat. That's what they've learned from the blue zones is retreat from meat um, to reduce dairy, or I'll give you my take on it to eliminate dairy. But the blue zones, they see reduced dairy. If they are having dairy, it's in a small amount. It's not that they're drinking a big glass of milk with every meal. They are slashing sugar. I like that too, slash sugar. Um, you know, they may have like the dates or the, the natural sources, but they're not adding all of that, the added sugar that you see in the United States. Eliminate eggs. Go easy on fish. There are a lot of communities that are near um, bodies of water. So they do consume um, so some of the blue zones consume some seafood or fish. Um, but if they do, it's usually in moderation. It's not our United States portions. And so once again, not all of them are um, many, many vegan people who are whole food plant-based in Loma Linda and many people who don't incorporate um, fish, but there are some communities who do. Snack on nuts. We see nuts throughout the blue zones communities, nuts and beans, nuts and beans, nuts and beans, um, daily dose of beans. Most of the people in the blue zones are eating a half cup to a cup of blue, of beans a day. So beans, beans, beans. Can't say enough good things about beans. Drink mostly water. They're not walking around with their soda um, or a big glass of milk. They're drinking mostly water, or maybe it's green tea, or maybe it's coffee, but they're not walking around with their, um, you know, with uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Go wholly whole. So a bunch of whole foods. I talked to some people in the blue zones who said like our, our fruit, our, our closest thing we have to a convenience fruit would be, would be unwrapping your orange and eating your orange. We don't have all of that packaged stuff that we're, that they're breaking open for their snacks that their snacks, the only thing that's really ready to eat without putting some ingredients together are their fruits. And then if you look at all the blue zones, you see that they're typically about 95 to 100% plant-based. So maybe a little space for some animal products, um, but, but they are definitely wholly whole plant predominant eating. And I believe that contributes a lot to their longevity. So lots of plants. These are some pictures of my, of my lunches. My son was sitting across from me and we would go to the restaurant. I'd be like, wait, don't take a bite yet. Let me take a picture of your beautiful food. So you can just see the beautiful things they do with plants, with the carrots. Um, it is a joy to eat. They are not um, depriving themselves. They are surrounded by fresh fruit. Here we were driving down, down the road and you see that there's fresh juice on the side of the road. There are fresh fruit, different types of fruit that I had never seen or eaten before. There's my, on the right, my son in a market. It, the market's there, the fresh produce, the whole foods, you're just surrounded by it. Natural foods, farm to table cooking. Um, they even had this one in English for us. I mean, it's just, it's, it's what they are. Of course you can find junk food. And unfortunately we're exporting some of our standard American diet there as well. I saw an, um, a, a brand opening of a Taco Bell, which, um, Anyway, we're exporting some of our standard American diet, but there still is so much um, to certain parts where there's still so much, so much good eating. And then the, the stores where you can buy all of this. My husband and daughter um, are sitting here at this table at this restaurant. And so the, um, the amazing woman who cooked our meal came and took our order. She then went back to her garden, which is out that back that um, husband. She picked some ingredients, went to her kitchen, she cooked for us and brought it out. So there's not fast food dining in the sense that we are used to being all over in the United States. It's a process. It's whole, it's fresh. Um, it's delicious. Their food. I can't tell you enough about how amazing their, their food is just eating all of these whole foods, um, these whole foods that are, are cooked that are prepared with love. I took a cooking class because I said their black beans are so good. I want to learn how to make them so I can come home and make them. And they, this is my daughter cutting up some garlic. And I said, you're not going to, you want her to just to cut up one of those little cloves of garlic, right? Not the whole thing. And they were like, no, go for the whole thing. Their food is not spicy, but it's very they use a lot of spices and it's very flavorful, very rich in flavor and cooking. They cook often on these uh, fogons or the outdoor stoves, um, but cooking is really a joyful experience than sitting down to eat with one another. Here's my son picking some coffee beans. They drink a lot of coffee, very proud of their coffee. Once again, not walking around with sugar sweetened beverages or sometimes they um, will do pipa fria, which are co young coconuts where they cut off the top and then you're able to drink it. And then afterwards you can cut out the coconut and eat it eat it as well, but they're not drinking those sugar sweetened beverages all of the time in our blue zones. They're using food as nourishment and food as fuel. When I look at what's happening in the blue zones among these healthy populations, food that's nutrient dense, that's minimally or even better unprocessed, that's anti-inflammatory, that's decreasing our inflammation, that is fiber rich, which is what we're so deficient of in so many of us in the United States. They eat more plants and less junk food to make it really simple. So I'm always a fan of trying to take people where they are at and moving them in the, the healthy direction. And this is from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So always trying to move people, move people toward that whole food plant-based way of eating as we really know that the research shows that that's what is aligned with health and longevity. I recommend that my, I so recommend, um, some of the recommendations are that you do 
consider doing a food intake journal and see what you're getting as far as fiber, as far as protein, as far as calcium. As many of your listeners probably already know, there's a lot of protein in plant products and in many plant products, and there's a lot of calcium and plant products too. So I encourage people to do this and really see what they're taking in every day. Consider using Dr. Greger's daily dozen. I love his nutritionfacts.org, keeping track of, you know, have you had your servings of beans every day and your cruciferous vegetables and um, getting your greens in? Those are just some simple things that you can do. Also, I think it's it's important, and I'm so thankful that we have people like Chef AJ who teach us how to make food that t- that tastes good because I did not learn that in medical school. Um, I'm actually still learning now how to taste. I know what healthy food is, but I'm learning to cook in a way that makes it delicious. My husband is there cooking next to me, and if the food does not taste good, he will not eat it. Um, and he has a, a family history of cardiac disease and and dementia many at a very young age. And so he is one of the main reasons why we started going whole food plant-based years ago, but it needs to taste delicious. And that's what we are working on is learning skills there so that we could take them home and translate it to my kitchen. Um, This huge, big fruit bowl I came back with that barely fit in my suitcase, but came back with this. I wanted to showcase fruits and vegetables because in Costa Rica, you're just surrounded by this beautiful, fresh fruit um, produce that just is delicious and you're ready to eat. And I wanted that to really stand out as a centerpiece in my kitchen. Nuts, having more nuts on hand, that's an easy thing to do to change your environment so that you have some. Once again, watch your portion sizes as um, nuts are calorie dense, um, but nuts have been associated with longevity doing meal prep. So prepping on the weekends or whenever it works for you so that you're not caught off guard without your unhealthy food. So meal prepping so that you have your holy whole, your plant predominant or um, whole food plant-based meals there with you when you need them. Some people, so this is really looking at the environment. What is the environment like? Is it supporting you or is it not supporting your healthy eating? For some people um, like myself, sometimes when I'm in a busier season of my life, I have some different meal delivery services where they bring in some ingredients so that I can um, not spend as much time chopping or shopping for them. Um, And so, so there are these resources too, that are beneficial for some people during certain seasons of their life. If it's, if it's cost, um, if it's not cost prohibitive. Smoothies. I'm a fan of smoothies. I get my kale smoothies every single day. So that's a great way to, to get in some extra servings of fruits and vegetables. Try to change your environment. We do not want these things around. We look at blue zone environments. There are people who are living into their hundreds probably don't have all of this ultra processed food that's neon color all around. So I advise, hopefully you can just not even buy this, right? Or if you have somebody in your family who needs to have it, who has it in the house and you can't convince them to not bring it into the house, hide it, put it, not hide it from them, but like put it away from them, put it where it's not out being shown to your kids. Every time they open the cupboard, I want my kids to open the refrigerator and open my pantries. And I want them to see whole foods and not ultra processed foods. So get these away, get them out of your environment, or if they are in your environment, hide them um, and don't make them easily accessible. So it's what you're seeing all the time. I love some of the research of Brian Wansink, um, and he uh, has some really interesting research on on, um, serving sizes and like our bowls and plates and how we plate things. And if we serve ourselves at the counter versus at the table, um, the sizes of our drinking glasses. And so I recommend using smaller plates. If you're somebody who struggles with that portion size, thinking about using smaller plates, smaller serving dishes, serving yourself, and then putting the, um, the, the dishes away rather than having them all out at the table where you can continue to get more and more servings or use a bigger plate for that salad and a smaller plate for something else where, you know, you need to limit that what you're having. And then don't, don't deprive yourself. What chef AJ teaches you and what I embrace is a delicious, healthy, nourishing, joy-filled way of eating. And so I think about the people who say, I have to give out my ice cream. And I say, no, just learn how to make nice cream. You can make some nice cream and you can put it with some berries and you can make it absolutely delicious. This is not a way of deprivation. It's a way of nourishing yourself and your body, your mind, your body um, through healthier eating and modeling what we learn in the blue zones. And then also savoring your food. They often enjoy meals with their friends. This is a cute little monkey. I took a picture of a couple of years ago when I was there and he just was eating um, the, I don't know what these are called, but these like these orange things one after another. And it was like, he was just enjoying them. His, the fur on his face was colored orange at the end. And he was just enjoying these with the other monkeys nearby. And so it's important to savor our food, to, um, to really enjoy it. And to really think about how is it nourishing our body, nourishing our connections, um, nourishing our, our emotional and mental well-being as well. So physical activity real briefly. 
And th there are two main components when I talk about physical activity. I like to talk to about doing some type of aerobic activity or something that's going to get your heart pumping. So moderate to vigorous physical activity, that's important. And that's on that X axis. Or So as we move across the screen to the right, the more moderate to vigorous physical activity, you go to a limit. But in general, doing more usually puts you further in that green. And this is red is an increased risk of mortality or early death green um, is less. And so if you can be high on your moderate to vis vigorous physical activity, so the recommendation is at least 150 minutes of mo at least moderate intensity activity every week, or, um, and then we have sitting time on the Y axis. And so as you sit more, so even if you're doing moderate to, vis to vigorous physical activity, if you're sitting all day, that still is associated with an increased mortality. Conversely, even if you're standing all day, but you aren't doing any moderate to visit vigorous physical activity that also decreases your or increases your risk of early mortality. You want to avoid that. I want each of you to avoid that and live long, healthy lives. This is a picture of a gym. My husband had to go around the block and so I could get, could get a picture because gyms are not prevalent in Costa Rica. They usually don't need to go to a gym. This actually was not in, this was outside of the blue zones, but they are walking. They are walking. You see people who are in their, probably in their eighties, nineties, who are walking up steep hills and down hills, walking to neighbors, walking to friends, walking to um, shops, staying outside of school, picking up their grandchildren. Um, it's their environment is set up in a way that encourages movement. So I want you to think, take from this, from the blue zones. What can you do to your environment to make it easier for you to move? What can you do? Is it maybe that you have a stationary bike that is downstairs that you never use? Is there a way you could put it in your bedroom next to your bed? So it's only a couple steps away from your bed, like I used to have, or is there a way that you can put some resistance bands? I have some kettlebells and a ball chair over there and some resistance bands. Can you move those into your everyday area? Can you put your walking shoes by the front door? What can you do to make your environment more supportive of getting the activity that helps you that will help you thrive and help your health. They also ride their bikes. Everyone here is somebody riding with his tools that probably to, to do a job or work, but they ride their bicycles. Um, they do a lot of gardening. There's very hilly environments. So not super flat, lots of hills that they're climbing up and down. Also, their homes are often, uh, many of them are very modest, um, but they do a lot of manual chores. And so this was a picture, it's kind of hard to see because it was as we were driving by, um, but it was somebody who was who was mopping their their front porch. They keep things immaculately clean. In fact, my my son said, "What? Where's all the graffiti? We see graffiti in the United States, but he noticed that there was not very much graffiti or litter in in Costa Rica. They take beautiful care of their um, of their environment. They're very proud of their biodiversity and their environment. They take very good care of it. Physical activity. This is in a picture I took in front of a church um, or a place uh, their spiritual home. Uh, but there are these soccer fields in front of most of the churches and you see the kids out there playing and the families out there playing, they're embracing physical activity or they're surfing on the, the many, that's not anyone in my family surfing. We don't, we're from Colorado. So we, um, anyway, we love the waves. We don't know how to surf, but a lot of them in Costa Rica that they are surfing, they are out there and they are moving. Somebody who I stopped to get in, um, directions from when we were on our way to a waterfall he was a gentleman who was probably in his 90s and was riding his horse and hopped off that horse and gave me some directions and hopped back on the horse, um, but they are moving. So I want to encourage you to mindfully move more. Be thoughtful of how much time you're spending sitting in your chair every day. And are there things that you could do to stand up and stretch during a commercial break, to stand up and stretch or move around or take a walk around your house or the block, or even if it's around the room, how can you mindfully move more? What obstacles are facing you? This is a picture of my wrist when I was designing a slide recently and it gave me the time to stand, stand up and move a little for one minute. So what can you do? Notice your obstacles. Is it hard because you have to be on a Zoom meeting for three hours every day? Well, could you get a standing desk or could you stand and stretch during the meeting? Um, that's becoming more, I think, acceptable. And I think that everyone should embrace allowing people to move while they're, while they're doing meetings. It helps all of us. But think of the obstacles you're facing and then think of what you can do to help overcome those obstacles that limit your physical activity. If you're worried about an injury or pain or unsure what to do, you're worried maybe you have osteoporosis and you want to make sure you're doing exercises that are appropriate for you, talk with your healthcare professional. Um, if you need clearance, if you have a medical condition and you're not exercising or moving, you know, stand to stretch. But if you want to start a program, talk to your doctor or your healthcare practitioner. Physical therapists are often great at helping us put together personalized workout programs that will get you the results that you want um, and really help tailor it to you and your needs. So I mentioned too, like putting your shoes out, my shoes out for my boys so that hopefully my husband and my son will go running in the morning, but it's easier if I have the shoes down there and ready to go. So is it leaving your running shoes by your front door all of the time? 
do what you enjoy. So I, um, after I went through chemotherapy, my bones weren't as strong as they were before I had osteopenia, um, from the, the chemotherapy associated with the chemotherapy treatments. And so I do what I enjoy. I do Zumba, um, try to do it every day in the six feet or so in front of my bed. I don't have a beautiful workout center. I had about six feet in front of my bed and I have my TV and I try to do my Zumba every day. So I'm getting in some weight bearing exercises, but they make me laugh. This is one where they have a lot of fun. It makes me smile. It's what I enjoy. So it's what I tend to do. Sit less and move more. If I just simplify the whole thing, sit less and move more um, and see what you can do to change your environment where it supports you moving more like what we see in the blue zones. So stress. We don't see as high of levels of stress in the blue zones as we do in the United States, which is not surprising. Our stress levels in the United States are crazy, crazy high. And we know that that higher level of stress is associated with an increased um, premature death and increased mortality. So here you can see this is just a, a an interesting study that I had where um, or that that I saw where it shows that as work strain increases, so does early mortality. So your uh, chances of dying early are higher for people who have cardio metabolic heart or metabolic disease, and they're also higher for people who have more job strain. And we see this time and time again, whether it's it's um, caregivers where somebody's in a really stressful caregiving job, that's a significant strain, or somebody has gone through a recent life change um, that's been really stressful. We have high levels of stress in the United States. So in, in Costa Rica, there's not as much focus on material wealth or on, on work. What we notice is people were, usually they were like, I love my job. I love being in this area. And then they would talk to us about their family or what they were doing after work. There was a big focus on life outside of work. Not that they didn't work. And in fact, when we were interacting with people, the Costa Rican people are some of the most loving, amazing people that I have met anywhere around the globe. Um, but they there wasn't such a focus on material possessions. They live in, in homes often that are much more modest. Um, um, and that that lack of of having such a focus on things, I think, is probably one of the things that contributes to their decreased stress. These are some pictures of the flowers I took when I was there a few weeks ago. Nature, they are out in nature. They are so proud of nature. They take care of nature. Um, we saw somebody who saw a piece of trash, and I was on a tour, and they stopped and got off and went back and found that little piece of trash. Like they they truly care about their environment, about um, about the plants, about the animals. Um, and that, that being in nature has been associated with decreased stress. They also have a strong spiritual foundation in Costa Rica and in the blue zones, we notice that thread of spiritual, having a spiritual or a, a faith family, spiritual home, even though they differ, but you, that's evident in Costa Rica that there's that close connection with spiritual health. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that you have to be a certain religion. It's, you know, what connects you with something bigger than yourself or what, for some people that's nature, for some people that's, that's their service of others. And for some people it is an organized faith community or religion, but that we think helps with that stress as well in the blue zones. Being out in nature, once again, getting out there and being, um, being around the surroundings. This is some pictures of my family out in nature in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is just gorgeous. They also spend a lot of time in community and we know that social connection decreases stress. And so these, you, we saw all these families, we were out um, enjoying the ocean, but we also noticed that there are many, many families who are out there as well. It's not like it's just all tourists, but they really live this life where they embrace nature, where they embrace community, where they embrace de-stressing and spending time together. Whereas I'm, um, it's, it's easy for me to be the go, go, go person. And that's something that I've been trying to do, especially since my breast cancer diagnosis is to learn to speak a little slower, which is hard for me. I have so much I wanted to say, and I'm so passionate, but speak a little slower, be a little calmer and, um, to try to embrace that, that pace and allow time to prioritize taking time for ourselves. So I like this picture or I like this. Um, I saw this stop sign. It was behind this, the beautiful, the plants and that, that stop, take time to stop and pause, which is hard. It's hard for me to stop and pause and say, what is causing me stress and what can I do to address it? What do I need to change? Um, is it that I need to shorten a meeting or is that I need to, to set better boundaries? What is it? So for tips, tips that relate to the blue zones, um, nature and stress reduction, get out in nature if you can, or bring up, bring some plants inside or find some rocks and bring them inside. Um, or is there a patio or is there a chair you could put outside so you can get outside, get outside and get some bright sunlight in the morning, which helps with sleep as well. What can you do to get out in nature to take walks or hikes? Maybe it's gardening or walking your dog, um, taking nature photos, like those pictures I took of those flowers. That was so fun. I'm not a professional photographer at all, but it's fun to get out there and to explore nature and really notice and be mindful of the beauty, collect pretty stones, walk barefoot and really feel the grass or the sand um, on your feet, all different things you can do to help with stress. 
but we know that stress is much more than just, um, than just taking some deep breaths though, deep breathing. There's a lot of good science behind that meditation. Um, you know, there's aromatherapy, there's all these different things, which are all great eating healthy, of course, supports, um, supports, uh, stress management, but really sometimes it's, it's more than that. So it's, is it, do, I, do you need information about addressing a certain problem? Do you need a referral to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a counselor, a mental health professional, or someone who can support you? Do you need counseling? Do you need help with setting goals? Do you need support, um, community support or resources? Um, or do you just need to practice? Or do you need to practice some of those self-care um, things that we know? Like I have taken mindfulness-based stress reduction classes. But if you ask me the last time I actually was truly trying to practice some of those things, oh, I'd be embarrassed to tell you it's been a little too long. So how can we take what we know we 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 can do for our own um, mental health and for stress reduction and management? And how can we really put that into practice and make that a priority? So sleep, sleep is another thing that's prioritized in the blue zone. On average, people in the blue zones are getting about seven to eight hours of sleep a night, which is what's recommended for optimal health. However, in the United States, we are a sleep deprived nation. We suffer with insomnia, um, chronic fatigue. There are so many things that um, that disrupt our sleep, the, the screens weigh at night, um, our, our high levels of stress, our 24 seven go, 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 not to mention our often our ultra processed foods and the sugar highs and lows. And so we want to do whatever we can to prioritize sleep and to give ourselves an environment that nurtures sleep. Impairment in sleep is not, um, sometimes extra sleep is thought of as being a luxury, but it isn't. When we have an adequate sleep, we can have, um, we have higher rates of depression and hypertension and type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, risk-taking behavior, all of these different things. It impacts our our reasoning, it impacts our mood, it impacts our cognitive function, our thinking, thinking. So it's so important that we are getting adequate sleep. Here's a couple of pictures of sloths that I've taken this one on the right. Well, I love the last time this little guy, he opened his eyes and looked at us, uh, readjusted his arm and then closed his eyes. Like, I don't care if you're there, but I'm going back to sleep, but they prioritize sleep. They, you know, at the end of the day, you wind down and, and go to bed, often going to bed um, in Costa Rica, often the sun goes down around six 30 or so, and it's up uh, sun is up early in the morning with the sounds of nature and um, just kind of going with that rhythm of rhythm of our uh, circadian rhythm and the and the days. Also, the environment, um, the environment it's it's beautiful, it's peaceful, and so it's important to think of your environment where you're sleeping in the blue zones. Um, in the blue zone zones, we think a lot about what is the, your environment need in order to support this behavior. So Dr. Beth Frades of, um, of Harvard, she talks about keeping your bedroom like a cave, having it be a little cool, having it be dark and having it be quiet. And if it's not dark enough, getting some room darkening shades or, um, or using some white noise or some earplugs, but what can you do to make your environment really conducive to sleep? Also, you just have to make a, uh, you have to prioritize sleep. So this is me while I was going through chemo. And that was when I really decided I'm going to prioritize sleep. So I'm, I'm that go, go, go type of person, but it was when going through chemo that it made me, that it made me sleep. Like there was no way to get to the next day without getting enough sleep or otherwise I was going to fall asleep in the middle of, in the middle of lunch the next day. Like I had to get sleep. And so that's really when I, I think I really realized it's importance. Like I would read about it and I knew it, but that's when I really realized truly realize on a different level, the importance of sleep. Sleep is like a superpower. If you are not sleeping uh, at least seven hours a night, if you're not getting at least seven hours a night of, of good sleep, you're really missing out on a superpower that can help you with so much of your, your well-being. Our daytime habits impact our sleep. We see in the blue zones that they eat beans and nuts and beans and nuts are associated with improved sleep. Avoid the sugar cycle that going up high and then that crashing that is bad for sleep. So whatever you can do to enjoy that fiber, um, plant-based protein and things that are helping to keep your blood sugar stable, eat high fiber, nutrient rich foods, try to keep a regular sleep and wake schedule. It's not good to have a certain schedule during the week and then try to catch up on it on the weekends. Um, it's good to maybe get some extra sleep, but it, you can't, you can't do that and have it be the same as if you had had that same amount every night, your body really likes that schedule move more when we're more active, more physically active during the day. It makes sleep typically better, but don't exercise close to bed, get bright morning light. So get outside and get some sunlight, be in nature and then manage stress. Those are all some tips that you can hopefully work with within your environment that will help you with sleep. And then look at your obstacles. Look at what is getting in your way. There are so many people who, who, especially women after menopause, who struggle with obstructive sleep apnea, who struggle with restless leg syndrome, who struggle with insomnia and different things. And, and there are so many different lifestyle modifications that can be made. 
I recommend that if you are, if you are someone who snores, that you go see your primary care provider or a sleep specialist to get checked out, to make sure you don't have sleep apnea. And if you do to get it adequately treated, um, or to address sleep problems that you're having, don't suffer in si silence. Some people think, well, oh, they only have medication for sleep, which is sometimes used. And I think it is sometimes appropriate. However, we have cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI, which is an amazing resource and has a lot of research behind it. Um, there's so many things that can be done to help with sleep. So don't, don't suffer in silence. If you're struggling with sleep, you are not alone. And then social connection, the last of the big pillars I'm going to discuss social connection. We see this super evident in the blue zones. I like this. Um, I think sometimes we think of like, oh, well, our relationships, we can kind of forget about those because I'm busy right now. I'm in a busy time of life and I don't have time for, for relationships or, or those connections, but really it's important for our physical and mental health. You can see on here, this is odds of decreased mortality. So living longer. So you live longer if you have more physical activity, right? You live longer. Um, you live longer if you abstain from alcohol versus excessive driving, dr drinking. You live longer if you don't smoke. Um, we also see you live longer. And in fact, quite a lot longer, even when you look at it compared to some of these other health be benefits, when you have strong social relationships. So social connection is powerful. It's important for health and it should not be minimized. I am fascinated with the leaf cutter ants. Whenever we see them, whether it's like we're walking to a store or whatever, if we see a, a path of leaf cutter ants, I'm the one who's like, stop, we have to see these ants. It's so amazing. So here's a picture I took of some leaf cutter ants the last time. And what it reminds me of is in the blue zones, we see people are working together in community. They're helping one another. When somebody has a hard time, somebody jumps in and helps. And so really trying to form those connections and working on those connections so that you have other people to help support you in time of need and so that you can support others when they they are going through a tough spot. We often see the connections between generations, between multiple generations. So is there anything that you can do to strengthen connections either within generations within your family, or maybe it's within people in your local community who are of various generations? Social connection does take work though. When I talk to patients about it, often they'll say, well, it just, and I'm, I'm an introvert, so I just don't do the social connection thing. Or, you know, a lot of my friends, they've, they've moved away. And I hear you, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people in the United States who are lonely. Um, it's something that most of us don't go around talking about like, hey, guess what, I'm lonely. Hey, anyone wanna be my friend? But there are a lot of people who are struggling with loneliness or struggling with not feeling socially connected. They may feel like they're connected on social media. They have a bunch of likes or something, but they, but they don't feel those deep social connections. And it's not that we need a thousand deep social connections. We just need to have a few of those deep relationships where we can call on people in times of need. So social connection, it is worthwhile to your physical and mental health. Um, it is important for your whole health. So not just mental health, but physical health too. And it takes work. It takes work. Um, with social connection, I encourage my patients to reestablish connections that may have been lost. For example, I'm doing a Zoom meeting tomorrow with a high school friend of mine. As I was making this, I was like, I need to practice what I'm telling others to do. Reestablishing connections is important. Strengthening connections that you already have. What can you do to really nurture those? And then maybe, maybe you want to create some new social connections, whether those are um, with somebody who's doing a certain activity that you like. Maybe it's with somebody within your faith, family, or circle. So it's, it's very good for us to be working on improving or strengthening our social connections. Consider joining a club or a group if you want to work on that. Take a class, connect with others outside of work, try to get more involved in your faith community, or maybe you attend or host a neighboring gather, neighborhood gathering, but look for ways to get out and connect with others. It is good for your health. Call old friends, schedule time for others, actually put it on your schedule so it's not that life just gets so busy you don't have that time. Make connection a priority. Be open-minded to connect with other people who may think differently than you or to meet people in different areas where you hadn't thought of before. Value yourself, remember your worth. Everyone has something so important to share with the world and know that if that there are people out there that are lonely and that could benefit from um, a kind word or a smile or getting to know you. So briefly, I want to talk about happiness. So when you when you mentioned why um, Costa Rica, Costa Rica, one of the things that I have learned is that Costa Rica is also a blue zone of happiness. You can get um, Dan Buettner's book, um, The Blue Zones, Blue Zones of Happiness. So there are the five longevity blue zones, which I showed on the map before, but there are also a few blue zones of happiness. And Costa Rica happens to be the only blue zone 
um, a longevity blue zone that is also a blue zone of happiness. People in Costa Rica are happy, which is why you hear from people who are over there, people who live there, people love Costa Rica. Um, there are different ind indexes and, and in the blue zones, they dive into that research more. This is just one that I found to show you um, visually. So on this happy planet, planet index rank, and you can dive into it and learn more if you want Costa Rica ranks one out of 152, the US ranks 122nd. Life expectancy is higher in Costa Rica. And that's looking at the whole population, not just the Nicoya Peninsula. Um, and so you can see that difference in, in well-being, even though we have a lot more money and possessions on average, um, even though we spend a lot more on healthcare, we are not, um, that those things aren't the things that buy us happiness. And we know that, right? Here's a picture of a sloth that I took, um, and he paused to smell these or he paused to like spend time. They move really slow, really slow. Like you see on the cartoons, really slow, but he paused and then stopped to check out these pink um, flowers or leaves or whatever that was. And it, it reminded me that they seem to take more time to stop and smell the roses. Uh, my daughter noticed that she would see people pulling over and not just tourists, but people pulling over to watch the sunset behind, um, behind the ocean. So taking that time, taking that time to really experience things. Here's my son holding a cacao fruit. They have delicious chocolate there and not the chocolate like ours that is ultra processed and has tons of sugar added in it. Um, but they actually, um, you know, you can go through the process of, of um, they show you how the whole process goes and you can, and you can see on the right, he's grinding the, the, um, grinding the chocolate too. So it's, it's not about deprivation. It's about joy. Maybe that's one of the things that makes these people so joyful is that they, they have good coffee. They have good chocolate. They love interacting. You can see this is an older gentleman interacting with my son, but they truly, they truly are a joyful, joyful people. They are grateful. They're grateful so much. Like we saw some people who had very little materially, but they said, I'm so thankful for all that I have. I'm so thankful. I live by this relative. I'm so thankful that I have this, this fresh fruit, that I have this tree or that I have access to this, these, um, this freshly ground coffee. They have access to these things. They're, they're a grateful people and a spiritual people. Um, I think one of the things that contributes to their happiness, of course, you can read all different research and different, different theories. I encourage you to read Dan Butner's book. I think it's because they spend time in nature. I think it's because that they are around surrounded by fresh fruit and produce and are eating so many of these whole plant-based foods. So those are some of my reflections upon the blue zones, taking some of Don, Dan Butner's work from the blue zone company and his reading, giving it my own spin and giving you my thoughts today. But just in closing, I want to tell you real briefly about an excursion that I am planning on um, this coming summer and want to invite you to consider. So it's called Thriving Through Lifestyle Medicine, an immersive wellness experience in Costa Rica's blue zone. So those two red dots are where we will be traveling and saying, if you decide you want to come with me, I want to take a group. I'm going to do a couple different weeks. Um, um, and we're going to travel to these two areas. The one, the more South red dot is Punta Islita, which is deep in the blue zone. The other one is by Playa Hermosa, which is close to the Liberian airport. It's just North of the blue zone, but it's by some really cool things that I want to help people experience deep in the blue zone. We're going to be staying at Punta Islita. It's in Guanacaste. Here's a picture of, they have these different, um, they have these different little areas where, where you stay. And then there's that central area that has the swimming pool and that has the, the central gathering area for meals and for education. The second hotel or resort that we'll be staying at is El Man Group, which, um, which also is a environmentally, um, environmentally forward blue zones following best practices uh, facility. So we'll be staying there as well. They're two beautiful, beautiful facilities. They're both part of the Autograph Marriott collection. Um, these are some of the different facilities we'll be using for our meetings. I'm hoping we can do as many outdoor meetings as possible with bringing these tables together and doing different workshops. I will be lecturing or doing workshops. I want it to be more interactive. Obviously, I'm not, um, I'll answer some questions afterwards, but this isn't as interactive as I would, would be if I were there with you in person. I would be like, ask me questions, ask me questions. I'm a professor who gets excited about that. But we'll have these interaction, um, usually about a couple hours a day where I present some material, where we have some discussion, where I really try to help you. Um, I guess, plan a healthy, live your best life possible and to do some different things through this experience that lets you take some of that home. The most Northern city has some really cool things by it, which is one of the reasons why we've chosen it. So if you're someone who wants to sit by the pool and, and eat your pineapple during the day, that is totally fine. If you're someone who wants to zip line, I did this all in one day. I went down a water slide that was over a thousand feet, 1,200 feet long. I um, used a natural sauna and then the painted the mud on, and it's, it's not like mud. Like I thought it was going to be, it's like volcanic. There's it's heated by the thermal, the volcano and you paint it on and they keep it warm for you. And it's, it's fabulous. Then you get in the hot springs. 
Um, and then there's the zip line. So for those of you who want adventure, you can join me because I would love to go do these again. So there'll be the workshops during part of the day, but then the rest of the day, will there'll be excursions if you want to do them. Some are, will be included, some will not. Or like I said, if you're somebody who wants to stay in the hammock, or by the pool, that is okay too. If you want to spend time, um, you know, if you're not, if you're not the person who wants to be zip lining, that's okay too. We'll have various options and you can stay at the resorts the whole time. They're beautiful. We're working with Rand, chef Randy Siles, who's a Michelin chef, who's one of the best known chefs in, um, Costa Rica. We're going to be doing one of the weeks that I'm doing will, will be whole food plant-based SOS exclusive. And he's going to work with us in order to put together a fabulous menu for everyone. His food. Oh my gosh. When I had it while I was there, ah, it's like, it's a work of art and he cooks all local from surrounding areas. And, um, anyway, he's a master. Will daily yoga will be included. I don't think I'll be trying this pose, but this is at one of the resorts, a picture they had on their website and I, or that they let me use, but there will be daily yoga. And for those of you who do very simple yoga poses like me, that was just fine. If you can do the yoga poses like this and that's what you want, that's okay too. Um, the kayaking is included. Here's my husband and my son um, kayaking in their beautiful, their beautiful water. Um, there'll be hike, some nature hikes with a biologist. Here is Punta Islita. So you can see that there are a lot of, a lot of hills there. Um, and the, you know, we'll be, we'll have some different nature hikes that you can take if, if you want. Uh, in Punta Islita, the community in the blue zone, they have a museum and they also have a place where they do different crafts. And so that will be something that's optional. If you want to join in on some crafts, there will be crafts that you can do with people with the local community. And I will be there doing crafts too. There's a macaw rescue, I believe by one of these two different locations. So you can choose to do that. Um, these are two pictures I took on our night walk this last time, a blue jeans frog, and then a red eyed tree frog. Yes, they really have red eyed tree frogs and they are as amazing as they look in pictures. Um, and they can be seen on the night on the night walks. And so uh, there'll be a lot of different opportunities. And then what my goal is, this is the, the book that I co-authored with two Harvard physicians, Dr. Amy Commander and Dr. Beth Brady, who actually created the program. I'll send everybody home with a copy of the book or have it shipped to their house because it's really important to me that it's not just a vacation, but it's a learning experience, that it's a, a time to learn a time to experience, and then to be able to take those lessons home. And Paving the Path to Wellness is the program that Dr. Beth Frady's put together at Harvard that um, has 12 different steps that help you live a long um, a guide to, to thriving with a healthy body, peaceful mind, and joyful heart. And I'll be on with Dr. Amy Commander, my co-author, one of the co-authors, talking about this on Saturday if you want to learn more about paving. So just a quick logistics, but otherwise you can go check out our website if you want to learn more about this trip. Um, Whole Food Plant-Based SOS will be July 15th through the 22nd, eight days, seven nights, daily lifestyle medicine workshops by myself. I may have, um, I may have some others join me for, for a little part of it. I'm not sure yet. I'm partnering with Educondo who has 20, um, over 20 years experience in doing professional learning programs in Costa Rica. All the lodging is included. So at Punta Islita and the Mangrove, as well as transportation between the two hotels, but not, you would take care of your own airfare that we could help you know where to fly into and all of that. Uh, it's for up to four people staying in the same room. So the cost is the same. If there's one, two, three, or four people in the room, the rooms are our biggest cost. All the daily lectures are included. The daily breakfasts are included. The welcome lunch, farewell gathering, kayaking, hiking, yoga, bird washing, farm to table culinary classes and coffee tasting. And then there'll be some other excursions that you would pay for separately if you decided that you wanted to do those. The package for up to four people um, is $4,500 or it would be more if you didn't wanna do a wire transfer, some different logistics since we're working with another company and with Educondo. Um, so feel free to reach out if you want to learn more. Here's my personal email. It's my school email because I'm a professor. Um, but here's my email, mtollip2 at msudenver.edu. Or you can email Educondo at um, there. If you want to take a picture of this, you, you sure are welcome to. Or you can go to our website, www.crlifestyle.net. And there's a place where you can put in if you want more information. You can send it. And then um, Roberto from Costa Rica and or I will get back in touch with you to give you more information. Or if you have information about anything I talked about today, I'm um, I'm. I'm happy to help in any way I can. This is my life's passion. I was passionate about this before my breast cancer diagnosis, but now being a breast cancer survivor and thriver through a whole food plant-based diet and lifestyle medicine, I'm even more on fire to try to help everyone I can during my time here. So Chef AJ, thank you so much for allowing me to come and speak with you and with your listeners. And I'm happy to take any questions. Now oh yeah, there, 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 there was a few, I've been watching the chat. One came and I didn't want to interrupt during the presentation, but when you were showing the food, Annette said, what was that thing that looked like an egg roll? Oh, I am actually not sure. That's a good question. I am not sure. That's in some of my different um, 
that one is actually not a picture from Costa Rica. That's in a food prep, like a food prep thing that I had from food prep picture. So I apologize. I'm actually not sure what that is, That's but the so food in Costa Rica, they eat a lot of the, they eat a lot of, um, a lot of rice, a lot of beans, a lot of um, picadillo with all different um, vegetables chopped up. When I went to the cooking class in Costa Rica, we actually went into the garden and picked some different things and then and then did the food, but I'm not sure what that is. My apologies. It sounds like an amazing trip, even for no other reason, just to see a sloth. Sloths are one of my favorite animals. They remind me of my dog. They're just so adorable. Yes, they are. They are. They are so cute. You know, you didn't look too bad with a shaved head. You, have, you seem to have like a perfectly <laughs> shaved head. Oh, I was somebody who couldn't, I got a wig and I tried it like one time and I was like, this is itchy. I am just doing the bald thing. So that, that was, I know different things for different people, but that's what it, um, for me, I just needed to do the bald thing. So. Yeah, I mean, your head is like a perfect shape for, I mean, if you're going to be bald, you know, amazing. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, it looks like such an amazing trip. You know, you were already living a pretty healthy lifestyle before even visiting Costa Rica. So what, did you change anything in your own lifestyle after visiting? Yeah. So I, I really tried to work on making beans taste better. I guess I didn't really, I knew like beans were important. So I'm going to get my beans in. And I, I just was eating a lot of bland beans. I think I needed to be listening to more or, you know, following more of your recipes. Um, but I realized how flavorful beans could be. And so when I came back that first time, I was like, I am determined to learn how to make these beans taste good. Um, beans and rice. So I really worked on that, um, different flavoring and trying, I, I broadened the amount of um, vegetables I use. I now use vegetables in the grocery store that had sat there before in the grocery store, but I'd never touched. And now I, and now I use um, a wider range of, of foods. I'm more adventuresome with what I try. And I, I'm more adventuresome with my kids as well, pushing them outside of their comfort zones. Um, I try to really have um, fruits around as snacks for my kids. I've, I've tried to limit even more their access to ultra processed foods because it's so addictive if it's, if it's around, um, I also, I think what, what changed for me too was, was trying to incorporate more daily movement. So I already was somebody who, I was going to exercise certain amount of minutes a day. And when I was a cancer, we got my cancer diagnosis. I was like, I looked at the research and, you know, I was ready to do what, what the research showed, but I realized I wasn't moving enough throughout my day. So now I try to follow like in, in um, some of the blue zones, the elders would sit on the floor. And so I try to sit on the floor more. I try to, just because that helps with, you know, having to stand up and sit down. I try to get up more and not be sitting in my chair all day. So I was, I become more mindful of just moving more throughout my day. Um, the, my neighbors probably think I'm crazy, but if I've been on a zoom meeting and I have a few minutes or even sometimes while I'm on a zoom meeting, I'll be doing jumping jacks. I'm like, my bones took, took a hit from, um, from chemotherapy. And so I'm like, I need to keep my bones strong. So I'll do some jumping jacks just because I know I'll be sitting, um, but really trying to be more mindful of movement sleep. I continue to prioritize, but stress. I think that's the one that I still struggle with the most Chef AJ is managing stress. Cause I get so excited about things that I want to do everything and I want to teach everyone. And it's all so exciting. Um, but really trying to take time to pause and to put time on my calendar where I don't have everything planned. So I think those are the things that I've really tried to take back from Costa Rica. And then also the gratitude, some of the things that we'll talk about in paving on Saturday, um, paving incorporates purpose and energy, like not just our uh, time management, but energy management. So purpose and energy, our attitude, and really looking at the research around what our attitude can do to help us live a healthy life, incorporating variety and investigations, really investigating what is it that fuels you? What foods, how do they feel? So being mindful and doing a journal to really see what is it that, that how you feel when you eat different things, or how do you feel when you do this type of activity or movement? Um, those are things, those are things too, that I think, um, I came back being more grateful for what I have feeling like I needed to get rid of some of my, I'm not somebody who's super into material possessions, but I felt like I needed to like clean things out, um, to simplify and to just be so grateful for what I have in the connections. Nice. Um, you know, there's, there's five blue zones. So I'm curious why you chose Costa Rica and maybe will you have other trips in the other four someday? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. So so honestly, um, so Costa Rica is somewhere I'd always wanted to visit. I love the, I saw the pictures of the sloths. I saw the pictures of the, oh, of the, the plants. And I mean, it's just, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous country. I don't know the stats offhand, but like the amount of biodiversity that they have in that country. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So, um, so yes. So I love Costa Rica and chose, I think for that reason, we were actually debating, should we go, should we go somewhere else? And we decided to stick with Costa Rica this last year and go back there again for a couple of weeks. Um, first of all, because I wanted to work on meeting some other people and putting this trip together that we'll be doing. And then also um, it's in the same time zone. And I wanted my boys to be able to go with, and we decided those other ones are just a little bit too big of a jump as far as time zones, though. I definitely plan on going there in the future. And I would love for 
anyone to join me to all of the blue zones. I need, there's more I need to learn. When I go to a country, I love to get in there and meet the local people and see what I can learn. Like, what can I learn that I can teach? What can I share with them? What can they share with me and with us? Um, but yeah, Costa Rica, I just, I'm in love with it. I plan on, if I, that's why I told um, Roberto, I said, if I could go to Costa Rica like a couple times a year and bring people with me and I could help teach them, like, oh my goodness, I love your country. I love your country. I, I feel like it makes me a better person, so. Nice. Uh, Cindy says, how did you get your kids to go out of their comfort zone? That's hard. And I would say I'm not, I haven't fully mastered it. Um, sometimes I'll make things and I'll be like, Hmm. <laughs> um, a lot of times I try to like anchor it to something that they've done before. And these aren't my tips. I've, I've taken these from dietitians or health experts in the past, but like anchor it to something they've done before. So rather than like doing a completely different meal, well, maybe I serve it with black beans that are, are flavored a certain way that they're used to. And then maybe I try to add in a different vegetable or, um, so having something that they're familiar with, I try not to hide ingredients. Um, though sometimes like I'll do a smoothie and, and introduce them to new things. They love smoothies too. We can put kale and spinach in it and, and different things and flavor it. Um, but but sometimes I can put new things in there and I can say, Hey, did you even know that you've had this before? This is actually in your smoothie. Or, oh, okay. Well in kale, that's not, um, not that unusual. Also getting them involved. My kids like to make a mess in the kitchen, which sometimes I'm like, I don't have time. I don't have time right now to cook with you, sweetie. I love you guys, but I can't cook with you because things go flying when they cook with me. Um, but, but getting them involved when they're involved in it, they're much more likely to want, um, to want to eat it. So they help me, they get up on their step stool and they help me with the beans and they help me with the rice and they help me. They love cutting things up. Um, so the more involved I get them, the more willing they are to try new things. So that's what, that's what works for, um, that's what works, works for me. And then also just having the healthy stuff really available. So if they open my refrigerator, they're going to see a lot of healthy options. And, and I think just over, they just gravitate toward, they, they, um, become used to having those, those healthy options. And they'll like, my kids will eat broccoli, like none other, like I can cook a giant thing of broccoli and think I've cooked enough. And my boys will anyway, I'll go through tons of broccoli. So I think too, just over time, they get used to those, those things. How many, Not kids, an expert, but how many yeah, kids do you have and what are their ages? Yeah. So I have a daughter that I had when I was in, uh, cause I'm an OB gyne, uh, an obstetrician gynecologist by original background and training. And I had her when I was in residency, she is 17 and a senior in high school. And I have six and nine year old boys who, um, who keep me very busy as well. And a great husband and dog. Oh, you had a dog. What kind of dog? A Portuguese water dog. Oh, that's a big dog. Yeah, he is. He is a big dog. It's nice. My daughter has some allergies and he doesn't shed, um, but he is just, uh, he is a wonderful dog. He's usually sitting right by me, but since we were recording, I decided to move him to his other area because sometimes he gets excited when I say something loud and then he would be jumping up and maybe you can bring him on Saturday. Maybe I can. Maybe come I can. Back. Well, Sherry's wondering what the weather will be like in Costa Rica in July. Yes, it is gorgeous. It's gorgeous. So um, Costa Rica is, um, is, it is pretty stable the entire year as far as sun up and sun down. And so, um, you know, the sun goes down around six 30 and it comes up around six. It's usually in the like eighties oh, ish. Um, it's usually like seventies to eighties, maybe, maybe low nineties, but it's really like eighties ish. It's beautiful as far as temperature. Um, the summer is what they would consider the rainy season. And so with the workshops, we might, um, with the workshops, they may sometimes be in the afternoon if we're going to expect like an afternoon shower. I've been now in Costa Rica for, um, a month over the last like, um, 15 months. I've been in Costa Rica for a month and I was there all during the rainy seasons and it only gotten and, um, ruined one of my excursions one day where I had to postpone it. So a lot of times they'll have some, some showers in the, in the afternoon. Um, and then usually the sun comes up and, um, if, if it rains at all, but that it will be the rainy season in the summer and our summer, it'll be their rainy season. So you're right. That is something, something to be mindful of as we do have the risk of, of some rain, but I think We'll have lots of things to do and it hasn't stopped us from doing anything really since. That's great. Linda commented, do you realize that the blue zones comes from the researcher having a blue market in his pocket at the time? Did you know that? That's interesting. That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Yes. Yeah. The research is fascinating. And I know it's not just Dan Butner. I mean, he's the main one on these books, but a whole, whole teams of people have really, really gotten to know these communities. And I'm really grateful for the work that's been done um, in all the areas. I mean, life's so much, we just keep learning more and more reasons every day why we should be eating whole food plant-based and why we should be moving more and stressing less and prioritizing sleep. Um, but yeah, I've heard that story too. And I, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth's asking if there's any restrictions. I'm guessing maybe she need, means, do you need to be vaccinated? Do you need enough proof or how does that working? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, there might be some recommendations. I'm trying to think. So my family, this time when we went, we didn't need any vaccinations, but we've traveled before. So I, I, I would need to, I would need to do some research. I'm not remembering right now if there are specific recommendations for Costa Rica, but, um, but Roberto would know. And I would definitely get those, get those to everyone. But before I went this last time, there was nothing special that my kids or any of us needed. Nice. And I saw another question from Cindy, something um, about singles. Oh, can you accommodate and organize for singles for the retreat or is it all shared housing? Yeah. So there, there are the rooms that have a couple of beds. So I think, and once again, I think Roberto is my expert in Costa Rica. He's awesome. I've met him the last couple of times I've gone over there too and spent time with him and talked with the general managers at both of these hotels. Um, there are some different facilities. So I know that there are different things that they can work with, but I think in the standard room that's included, there's like two queen beds, I think, um, but two beds. So you could have up to four people, but if you were going as a single, um, if you had a friend you could bring with, maybe you would each have a bed, or if you were somebody who was going and you didn't have a traveling companion, you could give us your name and Roberto could see if there was anybody else who was interested, or maybe we could help with reaching out to some. So we, you know, we're happy to help in any way, um, in any way we can. We don't have any, anything specifically figured out just for singles, but singles are welcome. Families are welcome. Um, that the educational part will be, will be for adults. Um, it'll be for adults, but I, my kids will be there. So I guess if somebody has kids and they want to play with my kids in the pool or something while we're doing the educational session, that would be welcome too. But singles, um, friends, everyone is welcome. Men, women, um, different ages, everyone's welcome. Right. Yeah, maybe could you talk about what your daily teachings workshops will be like? Maybe what a, what a day yeah. will be like for the retreat. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so I'm not sure when we're going to do the the teaching will probably be determined by the excursions that day. So if we're going to meet with, it's important to me that we meet with the community in the blue zone. Um, Punta is lead to the hotel does a great job of not, they do, um, I forget what it's called, but tourism where they are incorporated with the community. So they do, they do art lessons and they do the people from the community, they work there generation after generation. So it really is this supportive relationship, but it's important for me that we meet with the people in the community. So we'll have, there may, will be some lessons where it's incorporated into our, the excursions. Um, but then we'll probably have about a couple hours of education or talk time or workshops a day. Um, sometimes it might be broken up into one hour and one hour. We might do a couple hours together, but it wouldn't just be me talking at you for two hours because you would get bored. I love to talk, but I like even more to interact, but I will have some content that I share. There'll be, it'll be focused more on the, the week that where we'll be whole food plant-based SOS. We're actually doing two weeks back to back. So if you wanted to come two weeks, you could as well. One week we are doing a whole food plant-based SOS focused, and that one will focus a a little bit more on whole food plant-based SOS eating and um, a little bit less on the other pillars of lifestyle medicine, though that they will be covered. Um, so I'll talk about uh, physical activity, stress, sleep, social connection, energy management, um, and all of those as they relate to the blue zone. So taking the experiences that we're doing, how how um, can we take the blue zones research even deeper? I gave you, I just tried to give you a lot, a little of everything today. But how do we take all of that and dive deeper into the research? Dive deeper into actual practices, um, stress and sleep. So it'll cover those those lifestyle medicine pillars and really trying to look at the research, look at what's done in the blue zones. And then how do we put that into practice with your, with your life? Once you get home, what is it that you need to be successful? Um, which is why, um, which is why we're, uh, we don't want this to be a huge group. We want to, to make it, I don't know what our cutoff will be, but we don't want it to make it huge. I'd rather go there more times to the smaller group where I can really interact. Um, so a couple hours of teaching throughout the day and then excur then some excursions. Some will be included, like the kayaking. I know not everyone is going to want to zip line and that's okay. That'll be like that'll be an optional day if somebody wants to come zip line. Or of course you could go off and do your own things as well if you decided to, but we'll have some organized excursions that are included or like cooking. We'll definitely have cooking classes. We're going to work with um, Chef Randy. So cooking classes, it'll just be a variety, but it will be different activities. It'll be teaching and then some excursions off of the property, um, several included, and then some, some that are, will be optional if people want to do them or not. Nice. So how long have you been practicing lifestyle medicine and yeah. why were you so passionate about it? Yeah. So I, um, lifestyle medicine, I was a young ob -gyne. So I, I grew up eating ingredients from my dad's garden that my mom cooked and I, I exercised and, and slept well. And then I got, as I went through school to become a doctor, I studied more and more. I exercised less and less. Um, I ate a lot of, 
I, I didn't eat a lot of like junk food, but I ate a lot of processed food where it was a prepackaged meal and I would microwave it. And I thought it looked healthy because it, you know, but I ate a lot of food that was, was too processed. So as I went through training, I cooked less and less and to pretty much nothing at all, just eating from the cafeteria, the hospital cafeterias or food we'd bring in in the middle of the night. So as an OB gun, I was delivering babies in the middle of the night, not sleeping well, not prioritizing sleep was horribly stressed. I used to say the only time I'd run was when I was running to do an emergency delivery. So I didn't prioritize exercise and I was eating a lot of, a lot of processed foods, even though I was, I was, um, I wasn't eating, um, I have not been in, um, I I've been vegetarian at least for, for many years, but I, um, I wasn't eating all healthy. I wasn't eating the healthiest foods. And so, um, as I got into private practice as an OB guy, I realized that I wanted something different. So I started to kind of go on this own journey for myself of like, how do I get back to where I was healthy years ago? What, you know, I didn't learn it in medical school. I didn't learn about nutrition in medical school. So it was really like, I want to help myself. Also my husband, as I mentioned, several people in his family had heart attacks in their forties, died really early of heart disease. Um, we're now the guardian of his uncle, a uh, bachelor who has dementia, who we, um, who we help care for. And so I'd seen that in his family. I started looking at the research and I said, oh my goodness, it even more shows why we, why you should be eating less meat and potatoes. He came from Nebraska. So I'm like, it shows why this is important. I was already pulling him this way, um, but I showed him the evidence and it pulled him even, even further. So we moved that direction. And then the more I learned, the more I got excited about it and wanted to share it with others. And then eventually I went into being a full-time professor, volunteered doing lifestyle medicine. So it's probably been about like 15 years ago or so. I was one of the, the early, early members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I'm currently on their executive board. Um, but for me, it was being introduced and being guest faculty for the Harvard Institute of Lifestyle Medicine probably like 15 years ago. Now I'm getting connected with some of the amazing leaders and mentors. Yeah. Well, if you weren't such a fabulous doctor, you could be an auctioneer because you talk faster than anyone I know. Listening to you is like when I listen to Audible at 2.0, you're faster <laughs> than Dr. Furman. But I love it. I love it because you give so much information. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I promise when we're in Costa Rica to take a few deep breaths. I, there was so much I wanted to give you in like an no, hour. I know. I, I'm, I'm just teasing you because people tell me I talk fast. I'm like, well, yeah, that's Dr. Tolleson. But I love it. I love your energy. I love your passion. I love your compassion. And I love thank that you're coming you back in just two days with your colleague from Harvard. Tell us about her and what you guys are going to talk about on Saturday. Yes. Yes. So I'll be coming back with Dr. Amy Commander, who is, um, who is a breast cancer oncologist. She is at, um, but she's one of, one of the co-authors of this book. And we'll be talking about paving the path to wellness. It program was originally started by Dr. Beth Brady's out of Harvard for stroke survivors. But since then it's been modified for all different groups for breast cancer survivors. That's when I initially learned about it because I, um, after finishing treatment, I had so I've had seven or so sur sur reconstructive surgeries and I had um, 16 rounds of chemo. And afterwards I went to a survivorship group that did not really support my well-being. I felt like it was a book or it was a group that made me feel kind of more depressed and um, less of a, a joy for life. And Dr. Beth Brady said, why don't you join Dr. Amy Commanders um, online? They had just moved to Zoom because of the pandemic, but the online paving the path to wellness for breast cancer survivors. And I joined it thinking that I knew all of the, I already knew the nutrition extras that I don't need a support group or like a, you know, I don't need a group or something like that, but I learned more about purpose and attitude and variety and investigations and energy management um, and, and goal setting. So even though I knew the pillars of nutrition, exercise, stress, sleep, all of those, I learned a lot of really good things that I didn't know. And then just started working on, on doing a lot of paving work with Dr. Amy Commander and Dr. Beth Brady's. And then, um, yeah, that we did this book. So we'll be, we'll be there talking about the nonprofit organization. All the proceeds of the book go back to the nonprofit organization. If you want to check it out in advance, paving wellness, those two words just together, pavingwellness.org. Um, but it's a nonprofit organization that we feel can really help people live more joy-filled, longer, um, healthier, happier lives. So we'll be talking about that and answering right. questions. I love that. love name. Amy. She's amazing. Yeah. She's absolutely oh, I already awesome. love her name, Dr. Commander. I have yeah. such a great yes. name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. everything you talked about today, including how to get in touch with you personally by email or your Costa Rica trip or the book, it's all right below this video for those watching on YouTube and what we call the show notes so they can look at that. Great. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's been well, a joy. Thank you. I really, I really enjoyed your presentation as always. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Tollison. Oh, thank you, Chef AJ. Have a great yes, rest of your day. My pleasure. You too. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about an hour when my guest is Dr. Michael Roizen. Believe it or not, he is Dr. Esselstyn's boss at the Cleveland Clinic. He has a brand new book called The Great Brain Reboot, and he's going to talk about how we can crack the longevity code, which is a perfect is it called segue or after the
trying, I can't, what's, what's the word I'm thinking of? It's like this, you talked about the blue zones and longevity, and now he's going to follow a perfect follow-up to Dr. Yeah, I got it. I need a thesaurus. All right. Thanks so much. Take care again.